uh, column packing robustness, you think we would have figured this out, yeah, <laughs> by now. <laughs> um, but this is still a challenge. You know, I, I think the day I can retire is the day that we ha have not had any problems with chromatography columns in, you know, in the last two years or something like that. Um, I may never retire. It's, we haven't got there yet. This is still a complicated technology, getting and maintaining an integral bed. There's a lot of different equipment. Resins behave very differently. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to understand this better and standardize procedures across sites, et cetera. Um, cleaning, you know, so, so one thing my, my organization does is um, we call cleaning science and materials of construction. And, um, you know, when you're in a manufacturing plant, uh, you, you really don't work on the process that often. You think you'd be doing a lot of chromatography or bioreactors. What you really do is you clean and steam equipment. Like, that, that's what happens in these biopharmaceutical plants. It's a huge amount of what happens and what can go wrong, honestly, particularly when you work in multi-use facilities. And so this is an example of um, these, these coupons just show the kind of materials of construction that you'll have in, in any manufacturing plant, stainless steel, Teflon, EPDM, glass. Uh, multiple different soils have kind of been dropped on this, and you can kind of just visually see different materials treat soils differently, different soils treat materials differently. Um, and really, uh, you know, understanding and taking a risk-based approach to make sure that we're um, doing the best things for our manufacturing sites and cleaning our equipment. Okay, so you don't like cleaning equipment? No problem, just throw it away. Uh, this is the, the, the other trend we're seeing a lot of. Um, so I think Jens showed uh, some, some great examples here. I, I pulled out, this is a disposable chromatography column. But you, can, you can do everything disposable, right? You can, you can throw your entire um, equipment train away, and so this has become a, a very fast emerging technology. Okay, that was my 10 and under 10. Was anybody timing me? I don't know, did I make it? All right. Doesn't matter, you guys are kind of stuck here anyway. So, um, so this is a slide I want to acknowledge uh, colleagues in procurement for putting together. It is, a, it is about a year old now, so I do apologize that I, I didn't get it updated, but it just, it's kind of um, to follow on to that disposables. Um, we're having a lot of conversations, as many companies are, about disposables, and I think there's a lot of talk about disposable facilities. I just wanted to kind of highlight the fact that um, even if you are not building a brand new um, fully disposable facility, you are living with a lot of disposable single-use equipment, um, most likely. So this is the, the Genentech, um, the historical legacy Genentech manufacturing network. Um, on the left shows some manufacturing sites. Those are both, um, you don't need to know uh, what those acronyms stand for, but they're, they're sites, um, both um, drug substance and drug product manufacturing sites. And you can see on the right here in, in this graph, in this pie chart, um, we're using these single-use technologies across the board. And once again, these are all stainless steel plants. None of these are you know, fully disposable plants. But this technology, every time you're doing a tech transfer, you're doing a retrofit, you're trying to make something work, we're increasingly bringing more and more single-use technology into the organization. So whether or not you, you need to build a, a plant on the Amazon, um, you, you're probably in the business of understanding single-use technology. And it's not always easy, so you do, you do need to be innovative. <laughs> um, okay, so, so that's the manufacturing consistency piece. Um, you know, the, the next one I want to talk about is novel formats. And I'm just going to give some examples of, of novel formats um, that we're working on at Genentech. So one that there's definitely been talk at this conference is the bispecific format. And so there's, there's a lot of ways to make bispecifics. Um, you know, this is, uh, um, <clears throat> this is a slide from Genentech. And you know, this is a place to me where it's like, it's so good that we have platform processes because if we had to learn how to do this completely from scratch, if we weren't starting from some basis, I don't know how we would deliver this, right? Because this is hard. These novel formats can be very complicated. And some of the complications you might be able to just kind of gather from looking at this slide. First of all, the way that these are constructed is we do two half antibodies and they're, they are um, uh, fermented, they're cultured separately. So you can imagine that doesn't necessarily cleanly fit into um, current facilities. And you can imagine, since you're doing now two bioreactors instead of one, the amount of material generated um, is probably quite a bit more than your purification train may be uh, willing to handle. The other thing very um, interesting to note on this is the number of product-related impurities that you can come up um, with these bispecific antibodies. And so once again, this puts um, much more pressure um, on your purification platform than you otherwise would with a standard antibody. So this is a great place of a great example of where the fact that we are so good now at antibody manufacturing allows us to innovate and, and deliver medicines that can you know, do even more for patients. So, so the other one that there's been discussed a lot, in fact, it's being discussed right now, I know, in, in, another, uh, in, a, in a parallel stream, are antibody drug conjugates. So uh, we recently launched Cadsila, 
Um, this is once again not an advertisement for CAD Scylla, uh, but the commercial people draw these like beautiful little pictures, so um, I really like it. And CAD Scylla is our Herceptin antibody um, with these these chemo with a very potent uh, DM1 chemotherapy on it. And and the thing that I think just really this picture drives home to me is that. Um, you know, we spent so many years at Genentech delivering these antibodies, right? Antibodies as therapeutics, right? This was a revolutionary medicine. Now, in, in some ways, in, in these products, the antibody is kind of relegated to the background. The antibody is a very complex, potentially active intermediate, right? It's like a really fancy raw material <laughs> in some ways, right? The, the point of the antibody here is not therapeutic. The drug is the chemotherapy. The antibody is a very nice way to carry the chemotherapy exactly where we want it to go. Um, and so that, once again, really makes us think that we cannot put all of our development effort into making a perfect antibody here. We hopefully can rely on our experience and our platform so that the antibody is pretty easy um, because we really need to focus on attaching the antibody with this gray linker to a small molecule and making that as a sophisticated drug. And I will tell you, if you have not launched one of these things, which you know, many of you maybe haven't but are preparing to, they will rock your world, right? This is much more difficult. Um, then you can look, These are then, then you might expect, these are very sophisticated medicines, and once again, the antibody is just a small part of it, um, of the overall package, which is, which is a real game changer in my mind, the way we think about drugs. Um, okay, so novel formats, so, so just to kind of summarize there, I think there's some really fun new challenges with these, which of course means that we have to be innovative. Um, low volumes, which I'll talk about on the next slide, dual upstream processing trains, we saw more product-related impurities to remove, um, large and small molecules in one product, um, I, I can't remember how big our, um, our filing was for CAD Scylla, but it was, it was quite the paperweight, right, as, as you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> kind of like two, two plus filings in one. Um, Multi-product equipment concerns, um, partly if you think about all the, um, the cleaning, that we've, uh, cleaning practices we've established for multi-use facilities of antibodies. Now once, for example, you have an antibody drug conjugate, you have an antibody with cytotoxic compounds on it, you really need to rethink the way you do, for example, cleaning, cleaning validation and multi-product risk assessments health hazard classifications, particularly on the antibody drug conjugates, and product stability issues. Your, your um, platform formulations just may not necessarily be capable of handling these novel formats anymore. And so um, really might have to focus the effort there. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this, this concept of small volumes. And, um, and I think this is very much aligns uh, with Jens's talk in, in terms of where we're going as an industry. And I think there's some very interesting trends that are kind of converging. And in, in this case, I'm actually not even including emerging markets um, here. I think that also is a very important trend. Um, but even if we take emerging markets out of it, because I think there's still quite a bit of uncertainty and debate about how much local manufacturing is actually going to be required. But even if we take that out of the e equation, we really are seeing a shift in down the road in what we're going to see in manufacturing. And so if you look at things like the antibody drug conjugates, as an example, these are very high potency drugs. And they're one example of many um, where we are increasingly being able to design higher and higher potency therapeutics. And what that means is that we just need to produce a lot less of it in order um, for the patients to get the therapeutic benefit. So that is driving smaller volumes in terms of smaller volumes of drugs that need to pr be produced. Also, you know, the personalized medicine, also called the precision medicine, um, we really, as Jens described, we really are going to start targeting patient populations. This is going to be a market necessity. Payers, patients are going to demand that you don't just treat you know, lung cancer or brain cancer, but that you treat lung cancer or brain cancer, whatever it is, with a very specific diagnostic marker associated with it. Which means as manufacturers, we're going to have to start producing many, many more products at smaller volume in order to compete in the same market spaces. And so this is not necessarily how our current manufacturing networks are designed. Right now, um, certainly a company uh, like Genentech and I'd say most large biopharmaceuticals, um, they make a relatively small number of products and they make large quantities of it. Um, that, that will most likely change in the future. And so the interesting question is what will uh, manufacturing facilities look like in the future? Um, and and it's, not, it's not a great graphic, it's kind of small over here, but um, it, it really begs the question when you start doing lots of things at small volume, do you keep, when, at what point is your existing, optimizing your existing infrastructure um, the right thing to do and at what point is looking at more flexible or, or different plant and facility designs the right thing to do in order to deliver all of these? And I think that's a question we haven't answered and, um, and I love to come to these things and, and kind of see how other people are trying to answer it. 
Um, so the last area here, drug delivery. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I think it is so important. Actually, the next conference I'm going to go to is actually a drug delivery conference because I, I'm so interested in this area. And I think, you know, when I think about the kind of the resources that we potentially have freed up by becoming more platform, by being more mature um, at manufacturing our antibodies, um, you know, we have some really brilliant scientists and engineers that, that were able to figure that out. And so being able to, um, you know, kind of free up some of those resources to think about really creating better outcomes for patients beyond just the drug or beyond just the molecule, but thinking about um, patient convenience, patient compliance, which are still very big issues, even, even for life-saving drugs, which can be a little bit surprising. But the, the easier you can make this for patients, the better chance that you have a therapeutic benefit. And also particularly thinking, you know, we think a lot about patients, say, in a U.S. healthcare system, but as we truly try to reach every patient across the globe that wants access to these medicines, there's a large amount of variability in local regulations, local healthcare systems, you think about cold chain. Uh, there are a lot of really interesting um, problems to be solved in order to, you know, to completely realize um, the potential of the, the therapeutics that we are able to manufacture now with, with relative ease. Relative ease. Uh, um, so, so in summary, um, I hope uh, people are excited about the fact that there still is plenty of opportunities uh, to innovate in this industry. I think the, the, day we want, the day we run out of problems, once again, maybe, that, that, maybe that'll be the day I retire, but I, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, we're constantly pushing, getting more, much more sophisticated therapeutics with the novel formats. Even in the, the old, boring, you know, the, the enzymes from, uh, you know, two decades ago, there, we still um, have variability in those processes and the antibody processes. Um, and, you know, really being able to make sure we can manufacture things consistently. I'm really interested to see where manufacturing plant design goes in the next few years. Um, certainly the single-use uh, facilities are becoming more and more popular um, with all of their, their benefits and, uh, and challenges. So I think that's going to be a, a major change to the industry that we're talking a lot about. And of course, finally, drug delivery. Um, so with that, um, I will certainly take questions and I want to acknowledge, I tried to acknowledge the, the contributors on the slides and these are other people that reviewed and, and provided input to the presentation. So, thank you.